eschatology is? Well, Matthew Johnson. Study of end times. Study of end times. That is right. <coughs> Study of the end times. Today we're going to talk about your resurrection body. What will your body be like? You know, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 21 says, He will transform the body of our humble condition. Are you getting me? Man, you know what? I just pick this up. I got one. Philippians 3.21 says, He will transform the body of our humble condition to the likeness of His glorious body. By the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. Do we have slides or not? Okay. I want to talk to you today about not just resurrection in general. I think everybody has a pretty good... I mean, what is Christianity without the resurrection? I can't imagine why anybody would be a Christian if you didn't believe in a resurrection. What's the point? Today, I want to try to answer the question, what will your body be like? I bet you've wondered that, haven't you? What will my body be like after I'm raised from the dead? I want to start by talking a little bit about this man, Roger Williams. Some of y'all probably remember that name from your school days. He was the founder of Rhode Island. He lived a very long time ago, obviously. I found it in one of our states. He was also um, the man that established the first Baptist church in America. Lesser known about him. After he died in 1683, he was buried, as most people were back then, not in a common cemetery, but on his property. And being a great man, uh, a man of renown, in American history, uh, 177 years after he was buried, the people of Providence, Rhode Island, decided to exhume his body and place it in a memorial. They they wanted to they wanted to uh, kind of like pave over uh, his property, so, so to speak, and make a city park out of it. Now they knew where he was buried generally. But like a lot of old graves, it was kind of hard to find the exact spot. But they found it. They found it. And they found his casket. When they opened his casket, they didn't find him. They found that. A tree root of an apple tree that had broken into his casket, entered where his head would have been, and somehow... Whether it's real or not, I don't know. It might be legend. It sort of seemed to eat him. The, 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 the root took the shape of his spine. It split where you might find a man's legs, and it even curled up where you might find a man's feet. Consequently, just through some simple logic here, the founder of Rhode Island became a part of that tree, did he not? And the fruit that came from the tree contained a small part of Roger Williams. So it stands to reason that if you ate some of the apple from that apple tree, maybe you ate a little bit of Roger Williams. Kind of gross to think about. Now I just have to wonder. Assuming that Roger Williams indeed knew the Lord, and as a Baptist minister, I'm going to go out on that limb, what will the resurrection be like for him? What will his body be like? Will God have to remove parts of the apple tree to reconstitute his body? What about the people that ate from him? Or from his apple tree? <laughs> what is that going to be like? All the same, you know, it brings up other compelling questions I think we've all asked. What about people who have been cremated? How are their bodies going to be put back together? What about people that drowned or were lost at sea? Think about all those thousands of people over the years that have um, 
It's been lost at sea, and consider the Titanic or other shipwrecks. And of course, the body decomposes very quickly in the water. The fish becomes fish food. What happens to them? What happens to a person who is eaten by a fish and we eat the fish? What about those who donated organs or received organs that have been donated? I'm not here to tell you that I think we can definitively answer all these questions. And if I got your hopes up, I apologize. But we can begin to explore what the Bible says our resurrected bodies are going to be like. Because the Bible does give us some of those answers. The first thing to know, I, I want to give you two big things that I want you to know. The first is this. Whatever your resurrection body is going to be like, first of all, you're going to have to, right? That's not something I want to cover today, but you are going to have a <coughs> resurrection body. I think when some people think about what is heaven going to be like, sometimes the world's depictions of heaven creep in and we think of ourselves as floating on clouds and plucking harps or whatever. Nothing could be further from the truth. You are going to not just live for eternity, your soul, your spirit, you are going to have a body. It is going to be the same one that you have now, but supercharged, if, that, if I could use that phraseology. How? How is that possible? Well, number one, the sovereign power of God. The same God that spoke the universe into existence has the power to raise your body from the dead. Amen? Amen. He does. The, when you look at chapter 15, which is where we are, and I hope you've had your scriptures, verse 35, Paul asks a rhetorical question. He says, someone will ask, because there's always some nimwit out in the audience, right? I'm not saying speaking about any of you, of course. But Paul, forecasting that there's going to be somebody that asks the question, how are the dead raised? See, you have to ask this with a mocking voice, because that's exactly how they would have asked it. How are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? And of course, the person asking that, they know what happens to a human body. How long does it take for a human body to decompose? Not that long. The bones last a lot longer, but even the bones turn to dust eventually. If you're in the water, it happens a lot faster. They know this, and so they're asking, how can God do that? And Paul has to sort of slap them and say, he's God. You big nincompoop. You foolish person. Verse 36. God has the power to raise the dead. He has the power to do this because he is sovereign. He can do as he pleases. Look at verse 37. I'm sorry, verse 38. God gives it a body as he has chosen. As he has chosen. God can do whatever he pleases and as it, as it so happens, God is pleased to raise your body from the dead if you are in Christ. God, you know, by the way, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to really focus on this, but you're going to receive a resurrection body even if you're not in Christ. It's just that it will be tormented forever in hell. But we're talking about believers today. God is sovereign and He has the power to raise us up however He pleases. Now I have that little picture of that little acorn up there. That's not any random acorn. That is an acorn that I pull out my yard. There it is. Same one. Took that picture yesterday. I had glued the shell on, and the shell came off. I hate that. His little crown. But there he is. Little acorn. I, I think it's interesting the analogy that Paul uses, don't you? Look at what he says in verse 36. What you sow does not come to life unless it what? Unless it dies. Verse 37, what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain or tree. What kind of tree is that in our front in our side yard? That huge one. Is that an oak? It's an oak tree. 
Would it blow your mind if I told you that that little oak tree, that huge oak tree, which has been there for Lord knows how long, and it's so huge, used to be that. That's amazing, isn't it? We take it for granted because everybody knows that oak trees come from acorns. But it's almost impossible. If, I, if you did not know that oak trees came from this, you would never have guessed it, would you? Not in a million years. Why? Well, because they don't look the same. They're not even close to the same size. One is humongous if it fell over. I mean, if this falls on my head, it's not, I'm ba I'll barely notice it. But if that oak tree falls over, our house is gone. Y'all would have to put us in a hotel for a couple weeks. God, it says, can do anything he likes. And I don't know exactly what our bodies are going to be like. It's impossible to know exactly. But who would guess that an oak tree comes from this? There's no way you could predict it. So what will our bodies be like? Well, I don't know exactly, but I think in one respect, it's impossible to predict what they will be like. They're going to be magnificent. They're going to be the same, which brings me to my next point. It will be you, but you will be different. There's some continuity and some discontinuity. Just like a tree comes from an acorn, so your resurrection body will come from you, the body that you plant in the ground, or I guess more accurately, that others will plant in the ground for you. But when it sprouts, it's going to be something entirely different. It'll be you. I've always, haven't you wondered, will we know each other in heaven? People ask that question to me sometimes. Well, what, will I know my loved ones in heaven? The answer is obviously yes. Why wouldn't you? I think, I think we are obviously going to know each other. I, I don't even know if we're going to have any uh, visitors in heaven, anybody that we don't know. I think we might just know everybody when we get to heaven. I don't know that for a fact. But I know that I'm going to be me, and you're going to recognize me for me, even if I don't look the exact same way that I do right now, because my resurrection body is going to be different. How? I don't know, but it's going to be different. But here are some things that I do know about how different they will be. I know it's going to be me, but I know I'm going to be different. Here are the ways. Let's look at verses 42 and following. He says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. The first way that you're going to be different, and therefore that your body is going to be different, is that you will be undying. You're not going to even be able to die. If you wanted to die, you would not be able to. That is the pickle that the people in hell are going to be in. They're going to wish that they could die, and they won't be able to. But you'll be imperishable. You know, we all have perishable groceries and imperishable groceries. What do you do with the imperishables? Well, you, you, you put them out in the shed. You, you, put them up, you, you put them out in the garage. You do whatever you want to with them because they are not going to go bad. Those perishable groceries, though, you have to put them in the growth. You have to put them in the refrigerator. You have to eat them more quickly. Well, that's the case with our bodies right now. James says that your life is a... It's like a vapor. It was pretty cold this morning. It was even colder yesterday morning. Yesterday morning, I went out running. And I regretted it almost immediately because it was so cold. And every breath I had a little puff in my... But guess what? Every one of those breaths only lasted maybe a second. Maybe... Well, that's, that's our life. Our life, even if, I don't care if you're the oldest person in here today, this is why when we get older, we look back and say, boy, it all seems like it went by so quickly. Because in one respect, it did. Our life is a vapor. And at the end of it, 
we will die too unless the Lord comes first. But our new body is undying. Consider all the things that we do to avoid dying. You probably don't think about it much. How many of you wear your seatbelt? Probably most of you. How many of you eat broccoli or salads? Now, some of you enjoy it. Uh, my grand, my father-in-law used to say, I don't eat the food that my food eats. But it's good for you, right? We tell our kids, eat your broccoli, eat your spinach. We, some of us, exercise. And if you don't exercise, I bet this is going to be true about most of us. In this country, the average person aged 65 years age and older spends a whopping $11,000 a year on health care. That is a big number. Uh, the, the statistics say that outside of housing, health care is the number one cost for senior citizens. Why spend all that money on pills? and going and doctor visits and hospital visits. Why do all that? Because you don't want to die. We might not think of ourselves as being scared of death, but I challenge you. Go home, fill your bathtub up, put your head under water for about 30 seconds. See how quick you pull it up. When you can't breathe, all of a sudden, your desire to live explodes. In some ways, you ever thought about it this way? Living is a life spent avoiding dying. Now, I'm not saying, you know, we have offered that song, Live Like You Were Dying. I think Tim McGraw sang that. His point is, don't just hunker down. Don't just, you know, hey, live. Live it. But every day, we do something to avoid dying. But let me ask you this. How different would your life be if you never had to worry about dying? If you never had to worry about death? It'd be different, wouldn't it? Well, that's what your new body is going to be like. The second thing Paul says is, verse 43, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. I don't know if anybody has ever get, paid you the compliment by saying, you just are glorious. Anybody ever said that to you? Maybe not. Maybe some of you ladies on your wedding day, somebody said to you, you look glorious. But, Paul says that our current body goes into the ground. It is sown in dishonor. Now what does that mean? It comes back glorious. I, I think this is what he's talking about. Um, no matter how well you take care of your body, when you die, there's not much glory in that. There's not much glory in it. A rotting corpse has no glory. Now, we have ways of making a rotting corpse look better, of preserving that. Last, just last week, we were at my wife's grandmother's funeral, and it had been almost a month since she died. And she still looked about probably the same way that she did right after she died. And I know makeup has something to do with that. But um, boy, if the body begins to break down and it is a grotesque uh, couple of stages. Uh, what, an ancient writer from the four, early 400s, John Chrysostom wrote, before 30 days, the whole body is gone and the flesh cannot keep itself together. And I thought, what is he talking about? Does the body rot that quickly? And so I did a little research this week. You know there's four stages of decomposition? The first stage begins four minutes after your heart stops and you stop breathing. This is why even when people that are brain dead and their heart stops, they keep them breathing. Because while they're breathing, there's a chance. But if your heart stops and you stop breathing, four minutes go by and your body enters a stage called auto... Let's see if I can say this right. Autolysis. I'm probably not saying that right. But it goes from four minutes to 72 hours. And what happens is enzymes are released from your body that cause your body to begin digesting itself. Where the most water is, is where the most enzymes are released. So your brain and your liver are the first things to get eaten up, cannibalized, 
by your own body. Stage two takes between three and days three and five, and that's called bloat, gas, uh, produced by the body's self-digestion accumulates, causing a bloated, distorted appearance. Have any of you ever had the misfortune of walking up on or discovering a body that's been dead for a couple days? I bet Chatty has. Another one here. It is not pretty. I have to. It is not pretty. Some bodies, it says, swell to twice their normal size because of these gases. These gases produce a lot of pressure in the body, which, which force fluids inside of your body, because your body is eating itself, to evacuate from orifices, your mouth, your nose, your anus. Skin ruptures due to swelling, inviting flies and other insects to feed and lay eggs in our rotting bodies. You did not know you were going to hear about how the deep body decomposes this morning, did you? I came here to hear the gospel, Pastor. I am trying to describe for you how the body is sown in dishonor. I don't care how much money you spend on the funeral. I don't care how much... How, even the pharaohs who were wrapped up, their bodies went through the same process eventually. That's probably why they removed their internal organs, right? We can make ourselves look pretty when we go on the ground, but we are not going to stay pretty. We're going to go through all these stages. The third stage is active decay when maggots begin to consume your body. That's eight to ten days. I want you to think about this for a second. One day, maggots are going to eat you. Is that honorable or dishonorable? Is that glorious or inglorious? That's pretty dishonorable. Let's, let's be honest. That's kind of... Nobody wants to go out that way. That's how you're going to go out, friend. That's how I'm going to go out. <coughs> Your resurrection body, though, will be the opposite. It will be glorious. The Bible says that when Jesus appeared to Apostle John in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, he looked nothing like he did while he was on the earth. He shone like the sun. Now, I don't know if you are going to shine like the sun, but I know that your new body will be undying. It will be glorious. I don't know what that means, but it's going to be the opposite of the way we go into the ground. People are going to look at you and say, wow, you look good today, and that's going to last for all eternity. It's going to be awesome. The third thing Paul says, it is sown in weakness. It is raised and power. Your, your body is going to be powerful. The weakness that accompanies us as we age, as we contract diseases, as we get Alzheimer's and other crippling diseases will be turned on its head. You will never experience the pain of weakness or memory loss or any of these old things that happen. Bone, uh, what's that thing that happens to your bones when you get older? That's not the one where you hurt every day. Arthritis. Arthritis. Somebody said it and I heard it. Arthritis is also bad. I was thinking of arthritis. John Quincy Adams, one of our presidents, when he was 80, a friend asked him, how is John Quincy Adams? You know what he said back? He said, John Quincy Adams himself is very well. Thank you. But the house he lives in is sadly dilapidated. It is tottering on its foundations. The walls badly shattered. The roof is worn. The building trembles with every wind. I think that John Quincy Adams will have to move out of it before long. But he himself is very well. That's what happens in old age. The body begins to break down. It is weak. We saw this with our grandma. I'd say for the last three or four years, she was so weak, she could barely get around. She used to walk, sat in one chair almost all day. The only reason she got up was to go to the bathroom and take a shower. That was it. She became weak. <coughs> now this is the point often emphasized at funerals, when people say things like, they're not in that casket, they are running the streets of gold. 
That weakness doesn't accompany them any longer. I don't know if a spirit can run, but I'm going to keep saying it at funerals. <laughs> your body, can I encourage you? How many of you feel your body breaking down even now? won't always be the case. You're going to be raised in power. That is something to look forward to and even as you are dying. <coughs> Jesus, you're not going to let me stay this way. I will never die one day. I, I might go into the ground and become something grotesque and get eaten by maggots, but you're going to raise me in glory. I might be weak today, but you're going to raise me in power. You know, some people say about people that have died, they don't say rest in peace, they say rest in power. Anybody ever heard that? Forget rest in power, we're going to be raised in power. The last thing that he says is that it is shown in verse 44, a natural body is raised a spiritual body. Now don't get confused, he's not saying that your body won't be physical. He's making that distinction that he made in chapters 1, 2, and 3, that there is the natural man and there is the spiritual man. The natural man does not know God. He does not know Christ. He is not a saved man. He will spend forever in hell. The spiritual man is the one that knows Christ, the one who has been saved, and will spend forever in heaven. What he's saying is, you won't be able to sin in your new body. The life from this body will come from the life-giving Spirit And spiritual life, particularly the life of Christ, will be the power source for your physical being. Now in conclusion, now those are the four ways. I don't like that acorn. I don't know exactly what your body's going to be like, but I know four things about it. It will never die. It will be glorious. It will be powerful. And it will be sinless. All of those are different than what you experience today, Right? You experience the opposite of that today. You cannot help but sin every single day. You experience weakness every single day. You might say, Pastor, I'm young. I'm powerful. I have no weakness. Let me ask you a question. Do you sleep? Why do you sleep? Because you're tired. You're weak. Whether you want to admit it or not. You're going to be put in the ground and it's going to be a dishonorable thing. And you're going to die. But in Christ, look at this last verse, verse 49. Just as we have formed the image of the man of dust. Who is that? That's Adam. We shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. There's the man of dust, our father, Adam, who we all are made in the image of. Not just physically, but spiritually. We're all sinners. And then there's the image of the man of heaven. In one of his latter moments, Benjamin Franklin actually wrote his own epitaph. He wanted to put on uh, his tombstone. I don't, I don't think Benjamin Franklin was a saved man, but here's what he wrote. He said, the body of B. Franklin, printed like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out, and stripped of its lettering and gilding, lies here food for worms. But the work shall not be wholly lost, for it will, as he believed, appear once more in a new and more perfect edition, corrected and amended by the author. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. But will that be true of you? Will that be true of you? Will you be raised in a perfect edition? You will. If you bear the image of Christ. That is not a decision that you can make after you die. That is a decision that you come to before going to meet your maker. See, every single person here, every person that ever has existed or ever will exist, unless Christ comes, will go into the ground dead, dishonorable, weak, natural. But every person will also be raised up, some to honor, some to glory, some to dishonor, Revelation says. Some in power, some will be raised in weakness. And the reason is that some people will be raised in the image of Christ. Others will stay in the image of their father, Adam. The question is, 
Which are you? Do you bear the resemblance of Jesus? You must if you want this resurrection body. If you want to be raised to life everlasting, as Jesus said, you must place your faith in Him. And that's what the gospel is, right? The gospel is the, is the, is the idea that what Jesus said is true. That you are a sinner. That you've been a sinner since the day you were born. You're going to be a sinner to the day you die. And you're a sinner by birth and by choice. You choose to sin every day. And because of that, God's wrath remains on you. And if you don't repent of your sins and believe the gospel, God will judge you in your sins and send you to hell. And one of these days, He's going to raise up your body and He's going to cast that into the lake of fire. And that will be the worst possible ending for you. It might not be true for you. It might be true for some of your loved ones. Let me ask you this. Do you pray for them? But for you... I don't want to make this just about salvation. I want this to be a source of comfort. Some of you suffer a lot. Some of you experience pain every waking moment. Some of you, you can't even remember the last time you felt whole, the last time you felt well, the last time you really wanted to experience life. You can't even remember. Can I encourage you? You might be experiencing weakness, but God's going to raise you in power one day. Why? Because He loves you. He's going to take that old body that goes into the ground, He's going to raise it up, and He's going to make it into something that we just, we can't quite imagine. Like that acorn becoming an oak. We might have some ideas, but He's going to do something amazing. I want to encourage you with that. That is what you have to look forward to. Shall we pray? And uh, we're going to sing today.